Hi, this is David Harper of Bionic Turtle with a review of Adjusted Ray Rock. In other words, Adjusted Risk Adjusted Return on Capital. This is a difficult exhibit and is probably only for FRM candidates. What I've recreated is Table 14.4 from the assigned reading by Mikel Crowey on Adjusted Ray Rock. Because it's difficult, immediately after the screencast, I will upload the spreadsheet and you can take a closer look at the calculations at your convenience if you like. The reason I like that taking a closer look for FRM candidates is not because of the end result. As you know, the adjusted Ray Rock formula is a, itself is easy enough to memorize. However, walking through the process in 14.4, if you have the time, gives practice to several of the key building blocks in finance. So really, it's a really fabulous way to take a case study approach to several of the ideas, including capital asset pricing model, the structural Merton model is considered, and the, the Ray Rock formula itself, as well as adjusted Ray Rock. So first we need some assumptions. I used the same assumptions as found in table 14.4. And so my answers are almost the same. They're not exactly the same, but they're close enough. A risk-free rate of 5.13%. Market value of the firm's assets of 1,000. A tax assumption that is used only to convert the unlevered asset beta into a levered equity beta. And then two assumptions about the overall market. And that's because we're going to use the capital asset pricing model. The expected return for the overall market is 12% with volatility of 15%. Okay, then in terms of this 14.4, keep in mind it's all about a single firm and different assumptions about that firm's correlation with the market and changes to the firm's capital structure. What all of the eight scenarios here have in common is, by design, they all have the same probability of default. So I achieved that by altering the capital structures. The capital structure is shown right here in green, debt to equity. So I basically goal seeked to produce the right leverage that would make the probability of default 1%. So what we have here is in the top panel a low correlation scenario and in the bottom panel a high correlation scenario of 0.5. This correlation is the correlation between the firm's return on the firm's assets and the market's return. And so again, right away we get to use a key building block because the correlation is directly related to the firm's betas. And just to remind, I think my FRM candidates have had plenty of exposure to this, but beta is really a standardized covariance. That is to say, beta is really the covariance between the firm's assets and the market portfolio. That's the covariance here in the numerator. And then we divide by the market's variance in order to standardize it or to convert it into unitless form. And if we, we can expand the covariance into the product of three components, the correlation, and the respective volatilities of the firm's assets and the market portfolio. And if we do that, we can cancel one of the sigmas, that's the volatility of the market, and we can end up here with another expression for beta. Beta is equal to the correlation between the firm and the market multiplied by their respective volatility. So just wanted to remind that that correlation assumption that we see here, 0.5 in the high correlation scenario, leads directly to a beta for the firm. And so if we take the 0.25 correlation, then there's just a set of assumptions. Here is the firm's volatility increasing from 5 to 40%. And then the an assumption about the face value of the firm's debt. So that's specific. These are specifically the numbers I altered in order to ensure a 1% probability of default. And the 1% probably default, here's why this is a fabulous exercise, we, is we're using another uh, financial building block here. We use the Merton model to compute the probability of default. So I won't go into the details of that, but here you can see I've got a norm s dist. So what I'm really doing there is taking the 
inverse standard normal cumulative distribution of D2. So it's a Merton model, and that probability of default is based on the firm's return on assets. So you can see in all cases here, that's what they have in common. Then, given, given the input assumption about the firm's face value of debt, that implies that we know the capital structure right here, because here we've got the assumption of the firm's assets. And so it's very simple capital structure, debt plus equity equals the value of the firm's assets. And that gives me the firm's leverage, debt to equity. Then I've got the two betas for the firm, the asset beta, and now I got that just by using this at firm's asset beta as a function of correlation with the market, whoops, divided by, multiplied by the ratio of their volatilities. That gave me the firm's a, uh, asset beta, and then I uh, translated that into an equity beta, and that equity beta is a function of the firm's capital structure. And so now we're in a position to compute the return on equity. And I'd like to remind, part of the reason this may be confusing is that we seem to uh, switch from Ray Rock to return on equity, but in this context, Ray Rock is a return on equity measure. And so what we've got here is the return on equity. If I just take open up that formula, we're using a capital asset pricing model formula. This return on equity is just going to be the risk-free rate plus the equity beta multiplied by the equity risk premium. So we use the capital asset pricing model to get the expected return on equity. And so there's two conclusions here. The secondary conclusion is that notice the return on equities are not all the same. They're actually trending up here, specifically as the firm's asset beta is increasing. So the firm's asset beta is increasing. That's offset by a decrease in leverage, but constant probability of default or risk for the firm is not associated with constant return on equity. And then the more significant finding probably, or it shows up more dramatically, is as we increase the correlation, or double it from 0.25 to 0.5, notice we come down here, and the probability of default implied by the structural approach is still 1%. However, notice the return on equities, or the Ray Rocks, are significantly higher. We go from 10% to 16%. And how is that possible? Well, it's really mostly a function of this higher correlation, which shows up as a higher asset beta. Specifically, the asset beta is almost doubled. And then the leverage gives the uh, gooses up the equity beta even more. And so, in short, here's the headline. We increased the systematic risk of the firm without changing the probability of default, and we managed to significantly increase the return on equity. So if we just looked at return on equity or the first generation Rayrock, this set of scenarios looks much more appealing. There's a significantly higher first-generation Ray Rock in this scenario. However, it's been achieved or it's been purchased at the cost of significantly higher systematic risk. And so the adjusted Ray Rock, if I, if I do this formula here, it takes the Ray Rock, subtracts the risk-free rate, and then divides that quantity by the equity beta. And notice all of the scenarios have the same exact adjusted Ray Rock. So the idea with the second generation or adjusted Ray Rock is that it adjusts the Ray Rock to account for this risk. And so that's the uh, that's sort of a summary highlight approach to the spreadsheet. I'll upload it to the member page. This is David Harper with Bonnock Turtle. Thanks for your time.